There were some interesting discussions in class yesterday about software architecture, and I want to take a moment to explain some of the different pieces that came up within the context of our Pirate Translator. So I've gone in and I've made a couple of changes to the structure of the Pirate Translator. First of all, I've pulled out uh, this whole concept of identity translator and choosing translators because those just muddy up the waters. Um, so let's look at the slightly revised Pirate Translator. Um, I took out the button subclass, and instead we have a simple create button method here. The reason I showed button subclassing before was to demonstrate that you can do it. In retrospect, maybe I shouldn't have done that because that could be misinterpreted as you should do it. In fact, most often when we're using these uh, graphical user interface programming APIs, uh, we're just customizing the buttons through their APIs and not, uh, or actually customizing all of the widgets through their APIs and not just making new ones. Uh, so for example, we configure our stage by calling its methods, not by subclassing it. Or we configure uh, output field by calling its methods and not subclassing it. Similarly, here we create a button, call it translate. Uh, we set its action handler. So when it's clicked, this code runs. Uh, then we return that button and it gets added into the UI. Um, this created one other change that you might have noticed. Previously, the model reference, the pirate translator itself, was living inside of our button object, which actually is also really strange. Um, again, I was showing you what you can do and not what you should do. Uh, what I've done here is put the pirate translator in the UI. So my UI has an explicit reference through an instance field to the model layer. Um, there are other ways to get that reference in there. We could use dependency injection. Uh, we could send it in through the constructor, for example. But for such a simple case, it, it certainly makes sense for the UI to just instantiate the model. Uh, somebody has to instantiate the model. It seems simplest to have the UI do that. Uh, so let's make sure that this works as we expect. If we say hello, translate, yeah, good. Okay, so if we were to describe the software architecture, I would call it separable model because we've taken the model layer which is the translator and we've separated it from all of the user interaction code and prior to yesterday's discussions uh, that was all we really needed to say uh, but from yesterday's discussion we got into some some more complex ideas um, partially because some people have experience with uh, mobile development where you see some of these other patterns show up uh, this other architecture that comes up is a model view controller uh, and unlike separable model, where we just say we have a model on one side and then everything else on the other side, uh, in model view controller, we have three modules. There's the model, which is the, uh, as before, is the business logic, the domain model, and it's all covered by unit tests and doesn't touch the view at all. The view in this case is only the shell of what we see, sort of uh, non-interactively, just the pieces and components. And the controller is that which... Uh, mediates between the view and the model. So changes in the model go through the controller to get to the view. The changes in the view go through the controller to get to the model. So I want to show you how we can take the pirate translator and switch it over to model view controller. Um, so the first thing we'll do because we're using git is uh, let's actually make a branch to do some of this experimental code. So I'm going to say uh, team and switch to a new branch. We'll call this MVC. So we can see up here, we're no longer in master, now we're in this MVC branch. Um, now, where to start doing this is, is kind of a toss up. So I'm just gonna start somewhere. I'm gonna start by making a new class called controller. And again, depending on if you've been doing, say, uh, iPhone development, um, you might wanna call this something like a view controller. Uh, I don't like view controller as a term for the same reason that I don't like view model out of Microsoft's MVVM model. I think that just combining existing words to make compound words makes it really hard to understand what somebody is saying. Um, so we're just gonna call this controller. All right, um, so probably the simplest way to do this would be to simply expose some of these things like the input field, the output field, and the button from the UI so that the controller can get at them directly. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, currently, in the separable model approach, the UI object itself is instantiating the button and handling interactions with the button. If we want to make that something that the controller does, let's make the button uh, a public field here. 
So I will make a public final button. I will call it translate button. And we'll call that translate. Uh, anytime I'm exposing a field publicly like this, uh, I always make it final too, because uh, I don't want other agents like the controller to change what this ref what this uh, field references. Uh, it can manipulate it through mutators and accessors and other kinds of methods, um, but we don't want it to actually change which object this points to. So that's what final does here. Um, so we'll have to change the behavior of this a little bit. Uh, actually, I think we can literally get rid of that and change this from create button to translate button. So right now, if we run this, um, right, the button doesn't work anymore because nothing is, is watching it. So back over in controller, let's put a constructor in here and let's give this uh, the view as a parameter. So my controller can say when, when the controller is instantiated, it's going to grab that button uh, and in fact, let's see, I've got this on the clipboard here. What it's going to do is exactly this. I've got to clean up my copy and paste mess a little bit. So the controller, it'll reach into the view, look at that translate button, and say, all right, let me give this button an action handler, and that is going to talk to my model. So the model reference is no longer here. The, the view is ambivalent about what the model is because the controller is going to handle that. So we'll give that to the controller. I'm going to use Control-Shift-F to uh, format a little bit. Now, of course, when I take this action, it sends a request to the model, which is happening here, but that's parameterized by something that came from the view. And similarly, the result has to go back to the view. So I'm going to have to do the same trick here as I did uh, with the button. I'll make these public final. So now we have input field and output field there. That looks OK. Uh, let's drop back into the controller. These then have to be scoped as being part of the view object. Um, so I'm in an inner class here. I'm kind of surprised that I didn't have to make this final. Oh, I didn't save the file yet. That's the, that's the issue. Huh. That's surprising. Normally I uh, make the parameter final to make sure my inner class can see it. That's right. I'm not going to fiddle with that now. Control Shift O will organize my imports. That gets rid of the compiler warning. Over here we see again some compiler warnings. I'm looking at that little uh, yellow sign here uh, and I can see that they're up here so they're probably imports that aren't being used. Control Shift O organize those imports. Okay, so now if we run this, again, nothing should happen because we haven't actually created the controller. Um, somebody needs to create that controller. And again, just uh, for simplicity's sake, let's do it within the start method here of the UI. It will make itself a controller and send itself as an argument there. I'm not keeping a reference to it because I don't need one. I'll just create it. Now, now it works. So this is a very simplistic approach to model view controller. We've pulled out the interaction logic into the controller, op, uh, controller class, right? When we make a controller object, it does the interaction for us. Is that an improvement? Well, I don't know. There's a kind of a deeper problem here. So hopefully you followed so far. You know, since that's a logical piece of work, let's commit it. That'll make it obvious that this is a logical piece of work. So we... Uh, Check that. Introduce a controller to show MVC architecture. Uh, and we can say that this particular implementation uses public view fields. That's the piece that I'm worried about. But the idea of model view controller is that I want to put all of my controller logic in one place. But this controller implementation relies not on the view conceptually, but on the view implementation. Let me explain what I mean by that. If I wanted to change my user interface so that, for example, I could press enter on the input field and that would cause a translation instead of having a translate button, 
We can imagine that, right? Up here, we get rid of the translate button and we just have a little label that says press enter to translate. And then we say hello and enter and it works. That's reasonable, isn't it? And in fact, that's a view concept that we're rebuilding the view. The problem right now is that there's tight coupling between my controller and my view implementation. There's no abstraction there. Um, so really, by pulling this out, I've, I've kind of made things worse because this is so tightly coupled to the UI that it doesn't make sense to have it be in a separate place. Think about single responsibility principle. If I change my view so that pressing enter uh, is, is, uh, is used instead of the translate button, I now have to change two different classes and that's an SRP violation. So what do we do about that? Well, this is where things get a little trickier. So probably the best thing for me to do is to uh, actually start a new branch um, because this is going to look so much different from what we had here. I, I don't want these to be public. So let me just do this. Let me uh, switch to master again. So this is the original version. And let me just start another branch here. Sorry, uh, switch to new branch. And let's call this MVC2, which is not very descriptive, but if you're watching the video, you can follow along with these branches. Um, so again, let me start by making a controller. And now I want to abstract from the UI the concept of initiating translation. So I want my controller to be able to watch the view, to observe the view and say, ah, translation has been uh, requested. The user has said, let's start a translation. Not a button has been pressed, but an intention has happened. Um, now, in order to do that, I'm going to use a design pattern that, in fact, we already have inside of the solution. Uh, I'm going to use a design pattern called the observer design pattern. And the idea of the observer design pattern is anytime you have an object that might change, uh, you and you have another agent that wants to be notified of that change, you use observers. So let's set that up. I'll do this uh, maybe as quickly as I can here. It could be a little ugly. We'll do our best. Um, so the first concept is I need to be able to know when the UI changes. Let me make an interface and I'll call it... Um, there's a lot of ways to accomplish this. Let me say just very quickly that this listener idea shows up throughout JavaFX, throughout Swing, throughout any user interface library. I tend to implement this using inner classes because the name of this class, the sorry, the name of this interface is UI.listener. In fact, a little pop-up there tells you that. The name of it is UI.listener, um, which I prefer having to something called UI.listener. Uh, but at some point, it's just a matter of, uh, it's, it's idiolectic. It has to do with how somebody expresses themselves in language. Um, all right, back to this. Uh, the user has requested a translation. So let's make a method here called, uh, it's sometimes people call these on methods. You might say something like on request translation. And we can ask the question of what's the parameter? What do we send along to the controller when uh, translation has been requested? Uh, that's really a string. Um, we could encapsulate that into a new object. We could call a message or blurb or, or something like that. Let's just use strings because that's what our whole translator system is, is based on. Maybe we'll call this input or string to translate. Oh, we can always refactor it later. Okay, now I have a listener. I need to allow the controller to listen to this UI. That means I need a couple of pieces here. And these are all very conventional for the observer design pattern. I'm going to need a list of listeners. Oh, I don't have guava, um, so I'll say new. Uh, what did I just say? Guava. It's one of my favorite libraries that I use in Java, and it gives me some cool utility methods, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So we'll just use the built-in Java stuff. Let's make a new array list. Oops. Control Shift O to organize imports. So I'll have a list of listeners. I need a way to add listeners. Sometimes this method is called subscribe. Um, listener, listener, and I stick it into my list. Oops. Okay, 
so now what I want to do is when this button is clicked on, I'm not going to do any logic of interaction. I'm simply going to notify my listeners. So I'll say for every listener in my list of listeners, I will say listener dot, what can I call? On request translation. And what do we send it? Input field dot get text. So my view says, whoops, there. My view says anytime I click that button, I can, I, I will notify all of my listeners that there's been a change. Translation has been requested. Neat. So uh, let's see, we have a warning here. Um, oh, this field is never used. In fact, this field won't ever be used. We'll get rid of that. All right, there's time for refactoring later. First, make it work, then make it right. So our controller now uh, needs to listen to those events. And so well, many ways to accomplish this. Let's just take the most direct. Let's say this implements UI listener. So if I do that, that means I need to implement that method. Again, just a few fancy keyboard shortcuts to make that work. All right, so uh, when the controller gets this notification, it's going to call out to the model layer. All right, we need the model. Just like before. And, uh, you know, for our purposes, this is final, so might as well uh, mark that. Um, I know that I can get the translated string. So it's the controller that talks to the model, not the view. Um, what am I going to do with that? Well, you know, maybe what we'll do first is make sure all the pieces are all lined up. Um, we could set a breakpoint. We could just uh, take the old tried and true system out print line just to make sure things are tied together. Um, so, right, if we if we run this now, the pieces are not tied together. If I say hello here and then say translate nothing happens. I haven't made a controller. I haven't tied these pieces together. Um, so again, there's this question of who should be responsible for that. That gets into dependency management pretty quick. Um, we're just going to take a simple approach here again and say, uh, add listener, new controller. So when I create my UI, it's going to just attach its own controller to itself. Now, if I run this, You can see in uh, the console output here that that shows up. Neat. Uh, but that's only a one-way trip. How do I get the translated string here back into the UI without exposing that output field, right? The previous approach said, let's just make output field public. Well, we can use the same kind of uh, technique here with our listener interface. We can add a method called uh, set translated text, perhaps. That probably shouldn't go on the listener. Let's actually just make that a public method here. So we can add a method, public method, set translated text. Notice we're not saying get the output field and put some content into it. We're saying to this object, show this translated text wherever you think it belongs. Right? It's, it's the responsibility of the UI to say where that goes. Now, in our case, it's very simple UI. So we simply do this. Okay, so to tie these pieces together, the controller needs to be able to call set translated text. And with a sip of coffee, we can move forward. Okay. In order for the controller to call back to the UI, it needs a reference to the UI. This is, again, this is a concept of dependency injection. My controller has a dependency on the view, so somehow I have to get the view to it. And I'm going to take the most straightforward approach, which is called constructor injection. That is, simply send the dependency into the constructor. Let's see, UI view. This can hold on to that. 
hold the reference there. So now the controller is defined in part by its uh, relationship to the model and its relationship to the view. So here I can now call view dot set translated text uh, to translate it. Back to the UI. Uh, we this is uh, does not compile because we're not sending in the dependency. We'll send this the view itself. There we go. So to, what have we accomplished here? We have kept all of the fields private, the, the text fields, the buttons. Um, we're not exposing those, which means we can modify the UI implementation to have a completely different look as long as we comply with uh, what we've exposed through our public listener interface and our set translated text interface, uh, sorry, set translated text method, as long as those still uh, work semantically, like they, they do what is expected of them, then I can change my view without changing my controller. That's pretty neat. There's another important piece here, uh, you, you know, before I get too deep into this, let me make sure I keep my rhythm correct. I'm going to commit this because that'll make us say, what really did we do here? Um, add MVC implementation. Um, let's say, and we'll put a note here that says, this implementation does not expose, whoop, expose um, any of the UI widgets in the view. Instead, through an interface and new public method, that's a public interface. We allow the view and controller to change independently. Less coupling. Okay, good, uh, which is also better for a single responsibility principle. Good. Let's see, what else do we want to say about this? Um, Those are all the main pieces that are required for this approach to MVC. Here's the next problem. So you might say, well, this is, this is good. This is better uh, SRP, um, or at least this is good according to SRP. Uh, is it better than separable model? I say no, because it's more code spread over more places. Um, but there is another piece of it that's really valuable. Controllers, if written correctly, can be written with TDD. So I haven't shown that because I was doing kind of this refactoring extraction. Um, but your controller actually could be all test-driven. Sometimes that requires some tools we haven't looked at yet, like mocking libraries or uh, using uh, JUnit mocks. Uh, my particular favorite is called Makito. So if you're interested in, in checking that out, you certainly can. Um, I'm not going to go there. It's, it's not worth it for me in part because, like I said in, in class, I usually don't use model view controller. I use separable model for almost everything I do instead. Um, there's another piece here that I want you to think about, and I'll leave this as a challenge for you. If we use this approach, the model view controller, which I think is a better approach because we're following SRP. How do we deal with the problem of changing which translator we use through the user interface? So remember that in class, we built up this translator so that it could support multiple kinds of translation, pirate translation, identity translation, pig Latin translation. Uh, and we were able to select those with a combo box. So we would have to then have the UI also send messages over to the controller to say, hey, here's my currently selected one, or my selection has changed. Or alternatively, the controller would have to reach into the UI, uh, kind of like we did here, and say, uh, every time we go to translate, say, hey, what's your currently selected translation? And the real challenge there is to think about what are the dependencies? What are the things that can change separately? Like with our original approach to MVC, if we assume that we're going to use a combo box and the combo box never changes, well, that's easy, right? But if we want to allow the view to change how the combo box, uh, or sorry, how the translator is chosen, that changes things. Now, 
this leads to kind of what I consider the grand conclusion of this whole conversation. Uh, there's all these bits and pieces, there's all these technologies, there's all these approaches, and uh, it, they're all design problems. This is all design problems. It's a matter of, of balancing your, uh, your, your pros and your cons and your trade-offs. And so here's, here's the grand conclusion uh, as I see it. Uh, let's see, <laughs> except I have all different keyboard shortcuts for every, every different system I use. Solve the problem you have, not the problem you don't have, or the problem you might have someday. This is excellent advice. Solve the problem you have, not the problem you might have. So are we going to change that view so that we have to press enter, uh, or we can press enter instead of pressing the button? Are we going to change how these different combo boxes are selected? Uh, are we going to add a speech interface? Are we going to have a web-based interface? Are we going to turn this into a, a mobile application? <laughs> the sky's the limit of things you could do, and that becomes paralyzing. Uh, this, I think, is why I tend towards simpler architectures when I can, because I always want to solve the problem I have. I don't want to engineer it. I want to build a solution that I can test, or I guess we call it a, a prototype, right? It's a build a, a, an iteration that I can test with real people and see if I'm going along the right way. Um, because either I've, I've solved the problem and I can leave it alone, or by building a working model and testing it, I can figure out where I want to go next. I hope you enjoyed this discussion.